Good afternoon. I'm Mark Fountain. I am uh, honored to be the Honorary Consul of the Republic of Poland for North Carolina. You will see that down here. Uh, and uh, the uh, coat of arms for the state of Poland. I am equally honored to be the president of the Ignacy Jan Paderewski uh, Festival, Piano Festival of Raleigh, North Carolina and uh, to share with my wife responsibilities uh, for that particular uh, entity. Uh, we have an artistic director, Adam Pibrowski, who lives now in Krakow after some 40, 45 years in Paris. And we are proud each year to offer a piano festival in the month of November. This year will be November the 7th and 8th and November the 14th and 15th. And it is the seventh annual Ignacy Jan Paderewski Piano Festival of Raleigh. Uh, we began this in 2014, and uh, we have built it around a particular piano uh, about which you will hear again later. The uh, subject for today's talk is uh, Paderewski's concerts in North Carolina. He played nine concerts, which you see enumerated here, the earliest in 1905, the last in 1939, uh, one of the very last concerts he ever played anywhere. In between, we had several visits. Uh, the first was in Charlotte in 1905, the second was in Raleigh in 1917, and then we had a series in succession, three concerts in uh, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Asheville in 1923 in November. Then there was a standalone in Greensboro at the Carolina Theater in 1928. Two concerts in succession, one night after the other, in Durham and in Charlotte. And finally, a standalone concert in Raleigh in April of 1939. You'll see over here on the right that there are two Time Magazine covers. The earlier one here is from January the 23rd, 1928. That's a cover date. Remember that the uh, printing date will be approximately one week before that. Uh, the second one is uh, dated on the cover February the 27th, 1939. Now these two covers had very little to do with politics. They had everything to do with music. Uh, this particular cover in 1928 dealt with his 16th tour we have that written up over here. You'll notice my high-tech pointer, by the way, which is from the show campaign competition uh, for 2020, which has had to be uh, postponed to 2021. Uh, so I will use this high-tech pointer repeatedly here. So this is 1928, and the reason for that cover was the beginning of this piano concert tour. Nothing to do with politics, everything to do with music. The same thing goes in 1939. Everyone knew at that particular time, his being uh, approaching 79 years of age, that this would be his last tour. So uh, it was major news all over the United States. Everyone knew that he had to come and view Paderewski one last opportunity. Otherwise, it would pass by forever. So nine concerts in North Carolina. I would like to mention my debt, uh, intellectual debt. By the way, uh, my name is Mark Fountain. Again, I am an historian. I am not a musician. My wife is a graduate of New England Conservatory of Music, but I'm a graduate of Columbia University in the city of New York with a major in East Central European history, mainly Poland. And we'll come back to mention the connection of that with Paderewski. My debt, my uh, intellectual and uh, scholarly debt, is to a lady by the name of Małgorzata Perkowska. Małgorzata is uh, the Polish equivalent of Margaret. Uh, unfortunately, she died rather young, at the age of 61, some nine years ago. This book that she produced in 1990 is entitled Concert Diary of Paderewski. And it is an effort across quite a number of pages to produce a record of every concert he ever played. Now, I've discovered in various ways that there are a couple of concerts, at least, that do not appear here. In a work of this scope and this size, covering a concert life of 60 years, uh, there is bound to be some... some uh, 
item that might have been missed. I would like to point out one thing. In the indices for this particular book, all of the compositions which he ever played, he being Paderewski, remember, number 242. They are listed in order alphabetically by the composer, then by type of music within that uh, composer's herb. And uh, so you would look for etudes and then uh, concertos. Uh, concerto in Polish begins with a K. Uh, mazurkas, uh, etc., down through the alphabet and then by uh, opus number under that. 242 different compositions you will find here. Each one assigned a number, and then on each date in which he held a concert, the program will be laid out in a single line with uh, eight or ten numbers to tell you which compositions he played and in what order. It's a marvelous piece of work. This small picture right over here shows uh, Madame Polakowska in her archive uh, library in Krakow. A uh, marvelous woman. To show you again the level of musicology involved with this, this particular book has 532 pages. It was published in 2010, shortly before her death. And the title of it is Paderewski and His uh, Creative uh, Output, uh, would be a possible way. Creativity is what it means literally. We'll call it creative output. A history of the creations and a, an outline of the personality of uh, Paderewski, uh, person and personality, I would add on this as well. Heavy duty uh, musicology there. Indispensable works overall. Okay, now to North Carolina, the subject of our uh, lecture for today. This is a uh, map of population centers of North Carolina from the North Carolina Atlas. You'll see that Charlotte, this is approximately 1910, Charlotte has just surpassed Wilmington as the largest urban center in the state. Winston-Salem comes along close behind, Raleigh lags a little bit, and then we get all the smaller towns beyond that, Greensboro and Durham uh, being foremost, and Asheville as well, uh, among these uh, smaller entities. So a rural state. This is the reason that it was so late that Paderewski ever came to the South, and especially to North Carolina. He appeared first in New York in 1891 in November, so this is 13, uh, this appearance in Charlotte in January of 1905, is 13 and a quarter years after he first appeared in the United States. It shows you the relative importance of the state of North Carolina, i.e. Uh, relatively unimportant, uh, at a time before North Carolina had uh, increased population and cultural awareness. So a rural state. Now, Paderewski was no stranger to rural locations. This is a map of Poland, uh, an historical map of Poland, and I put it up here for two reasons. One, to show you where he was born, a little town called Kurowówka, well out in Ukraine uh, in today's maps. The second reason that I show you this is to show you the extent of Poland at one time. Uh, and the reason for this is that the psychology of the Poles is that they are a great nation. And you can see that is the case here, from Estonia through Latvia, through Lithuania, through uh, modern-day Belarus, modern-day Ukraine. All of those were at one time a part of Poland uh, up until approximately 1620. Then in 1667, they lost these areas east of the Dnieper. Uh, to orient you further, Kurywówka is here. This is Kiev, uh, the capital of Ukraine. And you'll see that Kuriwufka's birthplace is much closer to Kiev than it is even to Lvov uh, or Lviv in Ukrainian, Lemberg in German, Leopold in French, much less uh, how far away Warsaw is. So he was born quite a distance from the center of Polish culture, Warsaw. Uh, and uh, he was a Russian citizen at the time of his birth. Uh, his birthday, by the way, uh, according to the Roman Catholic calendar, the Gregorian calendar, is November the 18th, 1860. You will see this uh, displayed on occasion as November the 6th. November the 6th is the date on the Julian calendar, which was still in use in Russia at that time, all the way up until 1918. 
So uh, there's a 12-day discrepancy in the 19th century, and that's the reason for the difference. But technically, if we're looking at it from the Western Gregorian calendar, his birthday is November the 18th. So a, uh, a, uh, one, one final description of the, the differences, cultural differences at that time. To make it perhaps a little starker, the, uh, the Poles in these regions in the East were normally the aristocrats, uh, the great landowners. The peasantry was Ukrainian, at least in the Southeast, Belarusian in the uh, Northeast, uh, Lithuanian in some of these areas in modern day Lithuania. So, uh, and the middle classes were in many cases in these regions, Jewish. Uh, so that everyone needed to know several different languages, uh, the language of the home, the language of those who lived immediately surrounding and who worked for the estate, uh, the language of the administration, which would have been Russian uh, in these areas where he was born. Uh, German was very prominent in many of these cases, which along with Yiddish uh, allowed for a certain breadth and in internationality uh, in communications. So if you're looking for the reason for Paderewski's extraordinary ability in languages, right there it is. So uh, a marvelous period, a marvelous place, a marvelous time. Uh, this is a map in 1914 to show you the politics once again. The Russian Empire is in yellow. Uh, the uh, German Empire uh, in purple here. Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy in the south. And today's map, uh, Poland is here. You'll see Kuruwówka. Here's Lwów, Lviv, Lwów, Lemberg. Uh, and Kiev on out to the east uh, right here. So enough for the orientation there. One last thing on languages to show you the mix in this territory. Kuriwówka, once again here, you'll see it on a sea of yellow, in this case mainly uh, Ukrainian. Uh, great Russians appear only in this uppermost corner over on the right, out beyond uh, Smolensk, uh, and Belarusians in between. Uh, the Germans are put in here in uh, blue. An incredibly mixed area, which again demonstrates the value of learning all of these languages. So trains were the chosen method of travel. Cars are not invented, practically speaking, until after 1890. They were not readily available to the average uh, citizen, even in the United States, until the Model T and later, so 1910 and beyond. So everyone traveled by train. Here he is in the United States. We can tell when this picture was taken, approximately 1900, probably in the spring, considering the clothes that the people have on. And we know that it's that, that late because his wife is with him. He married her in 1899, and she began traveling with him from that point forward. He normally traveled in leased railway cars. He did not own a private car. He leased private cars on each one of his 20 uh, tours in the United States. Early on, it was a car called the General Stanley. The Pullman Company gave names to all of its cars, especially the uh, nicest of them. Uh, another about which we will hear later is known as the Superb. He had a considerable entourage here. He had a cook and servants. He had piano tuners, technicians, uh, other people traveling with him, secretaries, etc. So, a, quite a, a show here. Now, the state uh, of North Carolina, as I said, was relatively rural. Charlotte is the first uh, uh, city that he visits. And it's almost at exactly that moment that it surpasses Wilmington as the largest of the cities and towns in North Carolina. It had increased from 18,000 to 34,000 in the space of 10 years an 88% increase. We sometimes talk about various suburbs being uh, uh, very populous all of a sudden, uh, apparently uh, ballooning. Uh, it happened then as well. Wilmington grew much less. In 1910, it had 24,000, and it had advanced only 4,000 or 25% from what it had been in 1900. So the largest city in North Carolina, befitting uh, having uh, a first visit by a prominent international musical star. Now here we mention again the railways. This is the Southern Railway System, the old Southern Railway. Washington, D.C. is up here. The main line runs down through Virginia, and we come to 
Charlotte here that I've circled, Atlanta and on down to New Orleans. This is the old main line of the Southern Railway. So uh, Charlotte is on the way to Atlanta, if you will, and Atlanta is on the way to New Orleans, two destinations much larger than any city in North Carolina. So we are on the road to wherever. This is a postal card view of the station, the Southern Railway Station in Charlotte. This particular postcard was postmarked in 1905 in October. So we know that this is very much contemporary with his first appearance there. Uh, by the way, I, uh, one thing you will notice through this is that I need more information about the concerts outside of Raleigh and Durham and Asheville. I have a fair amount of information on those three. I'm lacking in information on Greensboro and Charlotte. I hope that all of you today from those two neighborhoods will be able to help me out in this. Here's the program in Charlotte, January 26, 1905, as I've reconstructed it from Perkowska's listing. Remember, she lists every work in the order in which they were played. So we can reconstruct the program. We're not sure about the time of day. He played sometimes in the afternoon, especially in the earlier tours, uh, later tours more often at night. So it's probable that this was already at 8 p.m. or 8.15, something of that kind. And here's the construction of the program. Uh, we have, and this, throughout his career, he plays more or less in this order. Some uh, major item from an earlier period, but as modified by Liszt. Uh, he had a great uh, deal of respect for Liszt. Uh, so you will see Bach Liszt, Schumann Liszt, Schubert Liszt, all of these things, uh, the version as done by Liszt. Fantasia and Fugue in A minor is the first one here. He then goes to a Beethoven sonata. This is quite often the case. Sometimes it varies, as you'll see later. This case is the, uh, in this case, it's the Appassionata. Then we move to an impromptu by Schubert. That was a Schubert block. Hark, hark, the lark. Uh, this was for the popularity. Uh, Errol Kearney was a, a major item at this time. So these were items that appear very frequently in the early concerts, and sometimes in later ones. After that, we get what I call a Chopin block, bloc in the French sense, B-L-O-C, that is a grouping of uh, items that have some relationship to one another, and these will normally include a ballade, uh, etude, uh, scherzo in this case, and a waltz, some combination of that. There might be more than one mazurka, there might be more than one etude, uh, there might be more than one of whatever, but it will be a Chopin block, uh, quite often including one of the ballades. Then he would be, on occasion, likely to put in one of his own compositions. So we hear here Paderewski, Miscellanea, Opus 16, Legend, Melodia, Tem, and Nocturne. So uh, these are not on every concert, but uh, fairly frequently. He had a, a stake, uh, obviously, in promoting his own work. And then he would end with a showpiece of some kind, uh, something again by Liszt, uh, being the uh, consummate showman. Uh, Liszt was appropriate for this. This is the Hungarian Rhapsody number no. six. Now I need uh, someone to go to the Charlotte Public Library and look all of this up on microfilm. Uh, once you can get into the library again, once the COVID-19 is uh, out and passed, or conquered in some fashion, or appeased in some fashion. So, and, and find out if there's a reported encore here. I would be very surprised if there were not. He played many encores, by the way, across the years. To go uh, between 1905 and 1917, the next appearance in Raleigh, uh, there were caricatures of him at this time. He was uh, with this huge bouffant hairdo of red hair. He was quite uh, attractive to women. This is a cartoon from a caricature from 1909. In 1909, there was competition to see who, which explorer, would be first to reach the North Pole. So this is a pun. Uh, he's running from his piano. He's being pursued by ladies of all ages. And the caption runs, a dash for the pole. This was the term used for the uh, competition among explorers to be first at the North Pole. Uh, obviously a wonderful pun here, dash for the pole, he being the pole rather than the North Pole. 
an English uh, caricature from about the same period. It's entitled down here at the bottom, P. Aderefsky, uh, Strand Barber. So uh, a comb in his hair, some pomade in his right hand, etc. This is a caricature from 1916 in the United States by a Dutch-American caricaturist, Tim Stork. Uh, I use this for the second uh, Paderewski poster, for the second uh, Potter, annual Paderewski piano festival in Raleigh. It's marvelous to me. We have his face. We have a right hand raised dramatically on high. We have the left hand drumming away at some list number uh, at the bottom left. Intervening also is World War I, uh, but prior to World War I, we have a show of Polish nationalism, an effort to demonstrate to the world that the Poles were still in existence, no state, no sovereign state, but a nation, a cultural entity uh, with great vibrancy. 1910 was the 500th anniversary of a very famous battle, at least in East Central Europe famous, uh, called the Battle of Tannenberg in Germany, or Grunwald in Polish. And in that battle, the uh, Polish-Lithuanian combined forces under Władysław Jagiel, whom you see here at the top of the monument, came out victorious over the Teutonic Knights. You'll see Ulrich von Jungingen down here at the bottom, lying prostrate on the ground, ergo defeated, totally. Uh, the, the Germans tore this monument down a couple of times, uh, and it had to be rebuilt the last time in the 1970s, some 30 years after it had been uh, destroyed in uh, World War I. Now, the money for this was put up by Paderewski. He had uh, vast amounts of money by this time, 1910, and uh, was uh, one who could finance the sculpted Cebulski in putting this together. The war breaks out on July the 28th uh, with a declaration of war by the Austrians. July the 31st was Paderewski's name day, and on that day in Rion Bosson, word came in to all the celebrants, of whom there were a great many, by the way, that uh, the Russians were mobilizing, and everyone knew that at that point, even more important than July the 28th, that there was a war. Uh, it was extremely difficult, a dramatic moment. So with the outbreak of the war, we began to have refugees. The Poles lined it up on two different sides, those following Pilsudski, who were mainly known as Austrian uh, uh, partisans, so to speak, political partisans, not, not uh, military partisans. Uh, under Piłsudski, there was a faction that was pro-Austrian. They looked to Austria as the solution for the reestablishing of a Polish state. Uh, on the other side were those who uh, looked to uh, Russia, not because they like Russians, they, they despise the Russians by and large, like almost all Poles, uh, but because Russia was the allied power uh, with whom they were uh, associated as citizens, and through Russia, they could get to France and to England, who were the important ones in the long term. So not pro-Russian, but anti-German is the real description of these people. And Paderewski was accounted in that camp. Well, the war produced refugees. These refugees were destitute in Paris among the Allies. So the, they were uh, employed by Madame Paderewska, uh, Helenka, Helena, to make dolls. And these dolls would then be sent to the United States and sold at concerts that Paderewski would play. So uh, they're very uh, prominent now. This is my doll, by the way. I have a doll. If you come to my house, I'll let you hold my doll. Uh, I'll not give it to you, but uh, I will keep it forever. Uh, my wife, by the way, doesn't know how much I paid for this doll. I got him on eBay. Uh, and uh, relatively cheap because he's somewhat the worst for wear. If you can find one of the 18-inch dolls, as mine is, in really good shape, it goes for at least $2,000 on eBay. And there's one listed right now for $4,000. I don't think this person will ever get $4,000 for it, but two is not out of the question. And you'll see each one has a medallion. Uh, if the medallion is missing, that uh, lowers the value of it. Uh, so uh, they are uh, quite collectible.
1916, in February, this is a Sunday right here, February the 6th, Paderewski gave a famous speech uh, before a concert in uh, Chicago, Chicago being the center of Polish-American culture. The basic stump speech, so to speak, uh, appeal uh, by Paderewski was typed up by none other than a lady from South Carolina, Mary Lee Swan, who uh, was a student at uh, Teachers College of Columbia University and answered an ad for a lady's secretary. The lady turned out to be Madame Paderewska, Ska, by the way, is feminine. Ski is masculine. That's the reason for the difference. We adopt here, by and large, women adopt here the ski and use that exclusively. But those who are prouder, especially those born in Poland, will retain the ska because they're very happy to be women and very proud of being women. Uh, so Mary Lee Swan becomes secretary, one of the secretaries to Madam Paderewska and therefore to Paderewski himself. Uh, for three and a half years, from April 1915 until November of 1918. Uh, so there is a typescript, most probably produced by her fingers on a typewriter, in the collections of the North Carolina uh, collection of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Library. You can go there and see it, as I have done. Uh, they're mixed in with the papers for Paul Green. Paul Green was a very close friend, so that uh, the... Uh, origins of the North Carolina Symphony are bound up with uh, Mary Lee Swan, later married Macmillan, a Columbia Law School graduate, and moved to Raleigh to uh, Cameron Park uh, on Park Drive, uh, just across the street practically from the shops in Cameron Village. So uh, a, a, a very remarkable woman. So we come to the second concert now, Raleigh, North Carolina, approximately 1917. It's a provincial town, despite being a capital. Here's Wilmington and Charlotte once again, to mention that there are two larger places. Uh, more than a quarter century had passed between Paderewski's first appearance in the U.S. and his first appearance in Raleigh. The population in 1910 for Raleigh was 19,000, and in 1920 it was 24,000, so we can surmise approximately 22 or 23,000 for a population at the time of his appearance. To give you some idea of a comparison, the little suburb of Holly Springs today, and by today I mean when I first produced this slide six years ago, uh, is uh, greater than the population of the city of Raleigh at the time Paderewski first came. So we have here also other items involved with the uh, city of Raleigh and his appearance here. The rail line for Raleigh is the seaboard airline. It was called airline because it was the straightest path from the Northeast to Miami, Florida. It connected with the Florida East Coast Railroad and that railroad was uh, financed by a marvelous fellow by the name of Flagler. Uh, Flagler in the 1880s married uh, a uh, North Carolina girl from Kenansville, North Carolina, uh, with the family name from that region, Kenan, so that you see immediately that the business school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, is named for exactly this family, this railroad group with long ties in the state of North Carolina including uh, a regiment in the Civil War raised by uh, Colonel Keenan. So here again is Washington, here is Raleigh, Columbia, Miami, and at this point he went all the way down to Key West, which is accessible by rail, uh, and dropped over to Havana, Cuba for a concert. So quite a marvelous uh, trip there. This is the Raleigh train station at that time approximately 1910, 1905, you'll see that there are three horse-drawn cabs waiting for passengers to come, and you will see that there is a, a streetcar in front. There were trolley tracks in front of this particular uh, train station. Here's another postal card view of this, slightly different angle. The cars, by the way, are dropped in. They, they are not true to life here. They're not part of the original picture. This building is still there, minus the tower. On this right side, the north side of that building is the Raleigh Fire Station Number 1. It's across the park from the old News and Observer uh, headquarters, so it's very easy to find it today. To show you how this worked, it was a head station 
there was a little spur line that came in straight in to uh, a dead halt. Uh, and uh, th then it was a short ride over to the Raleigh Municipal Auditorium, which is the location of the BB&T building today, that curtain wall construction. This is a picture of the Raleigh Municipal Auditorium here. The auditorium proper is in the rear with these three arched windows in the main entry here. This forward part uh, was the city hall and had archives and records of the city. To orient you a bit, this is the state capitol building situated as it is still today. This is St. Mary's School. This is the main building, uh, East Rock, West Rock, etc. This is the North Carolina Central Prison right here. And you see the rail lines, which are today in the same position they were at that time, minus this little spur that comes down almost to the legislative building, uh, which disappeared in the uh, 1940s. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I visited the old roundhouse uh, right here in 1950. So a uh, short drive over. Uh, the tickets were sold at a place called Boyle and Pierce. This building is still there. This shows it as it was rebuilt, renovated in 2014, to the appearance that it had at that time. You'll see this contemporary picture and one from today. Uh, the Raleigh Rotary Club sold the tickets. This was not unusual. It was normal for the time. There was a huge turnout. There were special trains that were laid on by Southern Railway for those living east and west of Raleigh by the seaboard coast or seaboard airline rather uh, for those north and south of Raleigh. Here are some items from the News and Observer leading up to this. This is the Southern Railway advertisement for special low round trip fares to come to Raleigh for the uh, concert. We have here Paderewski seats went like hotcakes yesterday mentioning that there were lines uh, to, to buy these tickets. An advertisement over here on the right from Darnell and Thomas. Darnell was a lady, a woman who owned her own business, uh, shared it with Thomas, uh, and they had a music shop in the first block as you're coming out from the Capitol, uh, right behind today's Appeals Court building. Uh, and uh, obviously they had a stake in selling piano rolls and other items dealing with music. Uh, Paderewski event now considered an assured success. In other words, this was entrepreneurial. We had to sell tickets in order to, to make it pay for itself. And it was an assured success. Uh, an advertisement for Steinway. There was no Steinway dealer in Raleigh at that time. The nearest Steinway dealer was in Richmond. And uh, from Richmond, uh, they could deliver this to anywhere in the eastern part of the state or anywhere in the state for that matter, because there's a line for Southern Railway also coming out of Richmond, down through Danville and Greensboro, Charlotte, as I mentioned earlier. So a marvelous point here. So what did he play in Raleigh? Here's another picture of the Municipal Auditorium. From the other angle, the, uh, the first picture was taken more or less to the Northeast. This picture is taken with a photographer facing Northwest. So here we see the main doors. The stage was at the far rear here, and it's asserted that there was a capacity of 5,000. I don't believe that. I've seen another uh, estimate of 3,500 as capacity, and I consider that uh, even then exaggerated, and I'll show you why a little later. So what do we play here? We know that this was at 8.30 because I've seen it in the uh, Raleigh News and Observer on microfilm. So what does he start with? Another early number, Bach version by Liszt the Fantasia and Fugue in A minor. Then we get a Beethoven uh, sonata, in this case, The Moonlight, 27 number two, C sharp minor. Then we go to Schubert again, in this case, Impromptu Serenade, and once again, Errol Kearney here, very popular number. Now, early on, the Chopin block, which here is rather uh, considerable, uh, sometimes did not include uh, the particular numbers. So we don't know which mazurka it is. We don't know which etude it is. We only know that there was an etude or a mazurka or a nocturne. So in these cases, I have put down question marks for each one of these. The little minuet down here by Paderewski, we don't know. He had more than one minuet. There's the famous one. Uh, but this is the way the concert was reported in the News Observer on the day following the concert. And we know from that newspaper report that he played the military polonaise as an encore. 
uh, perhaps the uh, only one that he played at that time. Now, this appearance in Raleigh coincided with a remarkable political moment in the life of the United States and the life of Poland. The United States was not yet in World War I. We did not declare war on Germany until April the 6th of 1917, and this is January the 23rd. Uh, this is the date of the concert, by the way. Now, here we are. This is Josephus Daniels, editor of the Raleigh News Observer. This is Edward Mandel House. Texan fellow who was a confidant of Woodrow Wilson and therefore a, uh, as a confidant, he was sort of the gatekeeper uh, for the president uh, for both of his terms. Unfortunately, he was shunted aside a bit at Versailles, a great mistake on the part of Wilson. This is Robert Lansing, Secretary of State. Josephus Daniels, because of his extraordinary services to the Democratic Party in North Carolina and the delivering of North Carolina in 1912 and again in 1916, was named Secretary of the Navy. His assistant secretary was a young man by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So keep in mind that all of these personal contacts early and in midlife redound uh, either favorably or unfavorably in later life. So personal contacts are always important. Edward Mandel House, I mentioned here, Robert Lansing, and we can mention uh, this all redounded to a marvelous event. On January the 10th, Edward Mandel House came to Paderewski's apartment and said he needed an aid memoir for President Wilson, advocating and giving the reasons for advocating. Uh, the proofs that Poland should be resurrected and made into a sovereign state once again. Uh, Paderewski had a concert that evening at Carnegie Hall, which he played, and as he came out for the next 36 hours nonstop, he produced this aid memoir, quite a number of pages. Uh, the secretaries were working on this and typing them up, so once again a Raleigh connection in here uh, for Mary Lee Swan, later Macmillan, who is typing on all of this. So this is the report on the morning of January the uh, 24th. Uh, I'm sorry, morning of January 23rd, uh, saying concert tonight, etc., and uh, detailing the speech that Woodrow Wilson gave, including these points that Paderewski had set out in his aid memoir. So what were these points? There are two of them involving Poland. By and large, these are, are, this speech was a declaration of war aims of the United States if and when the United States were to declare war. And only eight or nine weeks later, it did declare war. The first time that a major world power set itself out as supporting an independent, uh, sovereign Polish state with access to the sea. And these are those two parts. This is an independent uh, state of Poland here. The, the whole speech, by the way, this overnight uh, was done up and appeared in print the next morning. You think that we have rapid communication today. They also did pretty well in 1917. Then down here below, as part of a general look, there is uh, an advocacy of Polish access to the sea. Sea power was the great idea of the day. This is the underpinnings for Teddy Roosevelt, this is the British Navy in World War I uh, and ever since, and for decades and even centuries before that. Access to the sea, the influence of sea power upon history, the famous book by Edward Thayer uh, uh, McMahon. A word or two about Josephus Daniels, who was uh, living in Raleigh at this time. He was originally from Wilson editor of the News Observer. In 1935, 75th birthday of Paderewski, a, a tribute was published, a, a book with uh, dozens of letters from influential people. In this case, Josephus Daniels uh, was working for his former underling, uh, his former underling, remember, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who was in uh, this time, 1935, president of the United States and he named Josephus Daniels ambassador to Mexico. So here's a tribute to uh, Paderewski, which mentions this meeting Paderewski during World War I when he was Secretary of the Navy, uh, meeting him again in 1923 when Paderewski came to Raleigh for his second concert, 
And at that time in 1923, by the way, uh, Paderewski came over to Josephus Daniels House on Glenwood Avenue, the Masonic Lodge that you pass there just beyond the intersection with Wade Avenue, and uh, played on the uh, little house piano that they had there. In the World War I comes, uh, Paderewski returns to Poland in 1918, November, uh, almost immediately upon the signing of the armistice. He lands at uh, Gdańsk, Danzig, Proceeds to Post 9, there's an uprising there against the Prussian administration, moves on to a triumphal return to Warsaw itself. He is named Prime Minister on January the 16th, 1919. Uh, he's a compromise candidate, acceptable to both the right and the left. The left at this particular time is headed by uh, Joseph Piłsudski, or Józef Piłsudski in Polish, and the right is headed by Roman Domowski, about whom I wrote my doctoral dissertation, a far right-wing uh, politician who becomes even farther right-wing as time goes on. So he's a compromise candidate acceptable to both sides. Pilsudski never liked him, by the way. Pilsudski was rather mean-spirited all the way around because of the circumstances of Paderewski's marriage to uh, Helena. Uh, she had been married before, uh, the marriage was still valid, uh, and the two of them had to get an annulment from the Vatican in order to be married. So Piłsudski was all rather, always rather mean-spirited. He always called Madame Polarewska to her face, uh, Madame Kurska, which was her first married name. This is, uh, as I say, remarkably uh, mean-spirited, especially for that particular time. Uh, Paderewski was also foreign minister, and as such, he worked with Roman Domowski in Paris. Domowski had worked all through World War I in the West. Uh, Paris, London, Washington, Chicago, New York, everywhere lobbying for a sovereign Polish state. And the two of them signed for Poland in, uh, on June the 28th, 1919, the, the Treaty of Versailles. This is our poster from uh, last year, uh, 2019, the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. This particular quill, uh, out of which flows music, I would point out here, uh, is in the Polish Museum in Chicago. Uh, yet today, you can go there and see it yourself. Uh, as I said, this last item here, Paderewski resigns uh, only approximately 11 months after becoming prime minister, not quite a full 11 months for that matter. These differences with Pilsudski were rather uh, important and could not be papered over. So this was the source for all of these difficulties. And uh, Pilsu uh, Paderewski, rather, at that time left Poland for his famous home in Rio and Bolson in, uh, in Switzerland. This is Paderewski's pass to attend the sessions of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and that treaty reestablished Poland as a sovereign state, but it was uh, within the frontiers possible at that time given nationality conflicts, and his birthplace, Kuriwówka, was not uh, put into these new boundaries. It was too far to the east, remember, closer to Kiev even than it was to Limburg, and therefore outside Polish linguistic territory by anyone's estimate. So here's the program in Raleigh, November 23rd, 1923. Now I do have this program. I found this program on eBay. eBay is a marvelous place. You can find all sorts of things on it and I happen to run into this by sheer chance. Every day I put in Paderewski program on the eBay site to see what comes up. So this program I have. You can see again that it follows the same general uh, program uh, order. Bach list once again, uh, the Fantasia and Fugue. But this time we have a Haydn and a Mozart uh, thrown in here. And then we get to the Beethoven Sonata, 31 number two. Uh, and then a Brahms uh, number here, variations on the theme by Paganini. Then again, this block, the Chopin block that I always mention. And uh, in this case, it ends with a valse. And by this time, he's uh, in practically every instance putting opus numbers so we can tell you. We could reproduce a concert, by the way. We could reproduce it on piano rolls, for that matter. And I think I may try to do this at some point. I'm collecting piano rolls, too. 
And down here, the final number showpiece, Don Juan uh, Fantasia. Uh, again, this uh, list number uh, based on the theme by Mozart. This was played again in the Municipal Auditorium in Raleigh, the one that we saw earlier. I give you a slightly larger uh, reproduction of the uh, postal car here. There's the assertion of a capacity of 5,000. Here we look inside uh, one of the few existing position uh, pictures, depictions of the uh, interior. Uh, 3,500 is, I think, the maximum that you could really come up with. Here's the train station at that time. We've got a couple of covered entryways. We can see here still they've got the trolley tracks at this particular moment in the early to mid 1920s. Uh, we have uh, uh, a marvelous record for almost all of this. Now again, I have a love of Time magazines. I've framed something like 30 or 31 Time magazines. Everyone who is Polish who has ever appeared on the cover of Time magazine, such as Joseph Conrad, whose real name was Józef Konrad Kozienowski, uh, was on the sixth uh, cover ever produced by Time magazine. This one is a little bit later in the same year, uh, November uh, of uh, 1919. Uh, and we see here November the 26th is the cover date. Uh, we see here that there's a good deal of turmoil. This issue was on the newsstands in Raleigh at the time that uh, Paderewski played here. The, the, the date, cover date is the 26th, and remember it's produced on the 19th, and was on sale at least through the 26th here. Uh, so November 23rd is the date of the concert. So it was literally available uh, within close proximity of the uh, Municipal Auditorium in Raleigh. As I say, a, a, a time of great turmoil, the picture here is of Hugh Gibson, who was the first United States ambassador to the reestablished Polish uh, sovereign state. A great friend of Poland, by the way. There was hyperinflation in Germany. Most of you have read about this at some time. You know the pictures of people running around with wheelbarrow loads of paper uh, pretending to be cash. People were paid twice a day and they would rush out and try to buy something because literally the paper was worthless uh, by the end of the day. Uh, the Rentenmark in Germany was uh, established practically on this same moment uh, and uh, established order in the currency markets. Poland was tied to the German mark. In fact, it was called the Polish mark. It had been set up by the Germans in occupation in 1915-16, and it held on. So as a result of all of these uh, changes in Poland, there was a uh, reform as well, established by Władysław Grabski, and this is the origin of the Polish Złoty, which is a gilder, a gold piece. That's all Złoty means. Złoty means golden or gold. Uh, so, uh, and it takes a little longer for that. They feed it in carefully. Uh, establishing a new uh, currency is a very sensitive question. So uh, across the period between November and April of the following year, 1924, this new Polish currency, the Złoty, was established. Meanwhile, there are great upheavals, and that's the reason that uh, Hugh Gibson was on the cover, Upheavals in Krakow. So, uh, in 1923, immediately following the Raleigh program, there were programs in Charlotte and in uh, Asheville. In Charlotte, it's November the 26th, three days later, Asheville, four days after that. Uh, there is uh, some travel time there. And you see that the programs are remarkably the same. Now, we do know that in Asheville, he played quite a number of encores. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Again, exactly the same program as in Raleigh. In Asheville, as I said, I have more information about Asheville than I, because it's online. There's a place called newspapers.com. I can get the News Observer there. I can get the Asheville Citizen Times there. The Charlotte Observer is not there. The Greensboro News Record, etc., is not there. So it's a, a bit more difficult. I'll appreciate any help you can give me, by the way. Here's the auditorium in Asheville, as it was at that time. This postal card is from 1907. Uh, so we know that that was what it still looked like, even in 1923. It was replaced in 1937 by an Art Deco auditorium, which is the one still in use with renovations and modifications next door to the George Vanderbilt Hotel. So a uh, marvelous location there. 
And here we have, from the Asheville Citizen Times, the day following the concert, a review about encores to show you the prodigious efforts that Paderewski uh, went to in order to please his audiences. He was always concerned about the audience and how and what it would receive. It says here at the end of his program, some thinking doubtless that a man of his consequence would consider his time too valuable to entertain them longer than contracted, started to leave while others continued an incessant applause that brought him repeatedly back to his piano. Those who had started out paused in the aisles and stood for the best part of 20 minutes during which he played. Among other selections, a Schubert musicale, one of the numerous Hungarian rhapsodies by Liszt, and a diaphanous Debussy number. As he began to play the minuet of his own composition, the audience broke loose and interrupted his playing with loud applause. Well, what does this mean? We've got Schubert. This is Sikh, by the way, is the way it was spelled in the paper. We've got a Schubert. We've got a Hungarian Rhapsody. We've got a Debussy number. And we've got his own minuet. So a minimum of four encores. He always wanted to please the audience and bring them the best that he could. Shortly thereafter, we have a, uh, a remarkable event uh, in 1923 in Raleigh on this tour that we just mentioned here. Mary Lee McMillan uh, had moved to Raleigh to Cameron Park, 1810 Park Drive, and uh, become a prominent uh, local uh, lady married to one of the prominent local uh, lawyers. So uh, in 1923, she visited him in his private car at the Raleigh Railway Station, visited Paderewski, that is, and uh, reestablished their connection. Uh, she was so highly esteemed that uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Paderewski went to the Steinway shop on 14th Street and bought a piano for her and shipped it to Park Drive in Raleigh. He uh, had a concert the night before, Friday night is May the 9th in this case, in uh, Carnegie Hall, uh, including, uh, somewhat unusually, an item that was not exclusively piano, the P Beethoven Piano Trio, including uh, from Zembalist, the violinist, and Felix Salman, the uh, English cellist. So uh, you'll know this name, Ephraim Zembalist. Those of you who are old enough will remember Ephraim Zembalist, Jr., uh, star of uh, Route 66, the black and white film program from the late 50s and 60s. Uh, the granddaughter is Stephanie Zimbalis, by the way. But the famous Ephraim Zimbalis is the father. He was the head of the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, uh, which was practically, by the way, a Polish conservatory. Uh, they had Mieczysław Olszewski there. They had uh, Madame Simbridge. Uh, it was truly a marvelous period. Uh, on Saturday, as I say, he went in and bought this piano for Mary Lee McMillan and signed it and arranged for it to be sent to Raleigh. On Monday, he went in and recorded a large number of piano rolls, uh, and these are available today, at least a, a portion of this Noxos album. Something like seven of the items on this are reproductions of the recordings that he did on Monday uh, the uh, 20, I mean, sorry, Monday, the uh, 12th of uh, May, uh, 1924. Uh, I'll mention here the lady you see here. This is Ephraim Zimbalis. This is Felix Salman. The lady here is uh, Ephraim Zimbalis' wife, a woman by the name of uh, Alma Gluck, uh, a metropolitan opera singer. She had a marvelous daughter by the name of Marcia Davenport. This obviously a later married name, uh, whom you really should look up, by the way. She was a consort, intimate friend of Jan Masaryk. Uh, and in 1948, when he was killed, we have her witness to the fact that he was not despondent at the moment, and therefore his uh, death was not a suicide, but a probable uh, assassination by the KGB and his Czech minions. Here is the piano. This piano is still in Raleigh. It is now at our house. I'm approximately 10 to 12 feet away from it at this moment. Here is the signature itself, I.J. Paderewski, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. May 10th, 1924, he dates it. Very much preserved. This piano is used constantly. Uh, my wife teaches on it. Uh, we have two pianos here, two Steinways. The other is a B. Uh, my wife and I, when we were married in 2003, 
purchased this piano from the heirs, the grandchildren of Mary Lee Swan McMillan, uh, as a mutual wedding present. You are welcome to come and take a look at it at some point and play on it even for that matter. Now we move on to the concert in Greensboro, 1928, January 27th, Carolina Theater. Carolina Theater is still there. Uh, it's been renovated. We could hold concerts there once again. Mary Lee McMillan attends this again, 1928. Uh, she invites Archibald Henderson, a very famous figure in North Carolina history, uh, who includes Paderewski and his contemporary immortals that he publishes a year or two after this. This tour also involves a trip to Milwaukee, uh, where he meets the uh, little boy Liberace uh, and uh, pats him on the head and predicts a great future for him. Railway station in Greensboro, again here you can see how the program is constructed. In this case, he varies it a bit. This 1928 tour was a little different from many of the others. He starts with the Schumann number, the Symphonic Praetors. Then he goes to the Moonlight Sonata 27, number two, uh, we get uh, Liszt Schubert once again and the Chopin block. Hit a Paderewski number, Chant de Voyageur in this case, and the Hungarian Rhapsody to wind up as a fabulous number. 1931 tour, we have uh, a couple of uh, things to note here. The 1931 concert on January the 28th was supposed to be held once again in the Municipal Auditorium in Raleigh. Uh, it burned 10 weeks before the scheduled concert, so there was no venue in Raleigh. Page Auditorium at Duke University had just been completed at this time, so uh, everything was shifted to Durham, and this uh, there was a scramble to find a venue in 10 or 11 weeks, somewhere, anywhere that could hold the, uh, hold the uh, concert for the anticipated large crowd. So here's the ruin after the fire. Uh, this is a Sanborn fire map showing the outlay. This is the part that survived that later became the Raleigh City Hall and survived up into my high school years, 1960 or so. This is the auditorium back behind that was completely destroyed. Here we see Duke University, a postal card, uh, because the whole campus is integrated in the form of a cross. The, the old joke is that the med school is the head of Christ, the church is at the right hand, etc., and the pediment is, is down here where the students have their dormitory. This is Page Auditorium. You can see it by the fly tower right here. This was sponsored by the Duke Glee Club. It was the first major concert held at Page. And the, he arrived, Paderewski arrived, in the superb railway car. Uh, this is the program. This is the only common program that is known to exist. According to the lady who attended this, Dorothy Newsom Rankin, in all probability, he started the concert at 8.20, it was scheduled at 8.15, and he played until 10.35, she's got pencil notes down here, and she notes at least four encores down at the bottom. Again, proof that he was always uh, making an effort to please his audiences. This railway car that he arrived in on this particular tour is still in existence, it's in the Georgia Railway Museum, in Duluth, Georgia. You can go and take a look at it. The last Charlotte concert takes place on the next night. It is practically the same as the one at Duke. There's a different Beethoven sonata. Uh, one of the two mazurkas is different. Uh, again, he's in a superb railway car. And again, I would love to have some sort of information on this, if you can come up with it. I would love to have a program uh, from this particular concert. I'm always looking for it. The very last uh, concert in North Carolina took place in Raleigh on April the 28th, 1939. And it took place in the relatively new, uh, not quite uh, seven-year-old, Memorial Auditorium, which is still in existence today. It has been augmented by a lovely portico extension out in front and by the addition of Maimonde Concert Hall and Fletcher Theater on each side. So uh, you can still visit these uh, locations. This is a newspaper from the morning of the concert in Raleigh. You'll note this partial headline over here. This is Chamberlain speaking. This is the Prime Minister of England at this particular time. You'll see that Germany is awaiting Hitler's speech. And here's a picture of Paderewski, much aged, uh, as he arrived in Raleigh uh, for the concert.
Now, the original date for this concert was the 29th. I mentioned that uh, sometimes these dates change a bit. I have the ticket stubs for this. This program was given to me uh, by a member of our board. It's the eighth from the last concert he ever played. And you can see here that he begins, in this case, with a Haydn and goes through the various uh, items in the system there. Uh, he's approaching the end of the road. Uh, in this case, it says that he's somewhat weak, much aged uh, since his last appearance. But it notes here, once at the keyboard, however, the Podoreski fingers recovered much of their old magic and carried him through a program of Beethoven, uh, Chopin, Schubert, and others without faltering, uh, a recognition of his age. And finally, we've got the last two or three slides quickly here. This is the report from the next morning on the, uh, from which that review was taken, by the way. And you see every headline on this uh, portends great danger. Here's Mussolini taking steps to bolster his armed force. Hitler spurns Roosevelt, plea for Sherpa, breaks ties with Poland. This whole article here. Comment at Washington, mostly of the gloomy type. My favorite headline here is Poles to resist Hitler pressure. They never gave up. From the first day of World War II, September 1, 1939, to the very last day, uh, May the 8th of the campaigns in Europe, the Poles were in the field. This is a notation here that the uh, former Polish premier, being Paderewski, sleeps through Hitler. It's not that he was absent-minded. He was tired from his concert. One of the most interesting aspects of all of this is a picture here. Uh, this man's name is Charles Smith. He and his two brothers worked for the News and Observer. In 1916, he went north to begin working with the Pullman Corporation uh, as a porter. Uh, so we have a Raleigh connection uh, with this. I'm working as hard as I can. Everyone I meet, I ask, do you know of any descendants of these three Smith brothers who were around and who may have information either in their memories or literally in realia that they can let me know about him. We have uh, here an up close picture of the program played at that time. And then we can look here. This is a program that's apocryphal to some degree. This was supposed to be held in Madison Square Garden on May the 28th, so exactly four weeks later. Uh, this program he never played. The audience was present, uh, thousands of men and women, so this program is not a rarity. Uh, I have my own copy of it here. But he was unable to go on, uh, so it is a very interesting uh, program that never existed, and therefore I termed it apocryphal. So here's that last tour, eighth from the last concert, seventh from the last, sixth, fifth, fourth, etc., etc., and here's the concert at Madison Square Garden, which I name as Minus One. The, uh, the last concert actually played was played in Rochester at uh, the uh, Eastman School of Music uh, four days before well, May the 21st, and I have almost all of these programs in my possession. As I mentioned, I have any number of uh, requests of you. Uh, if you come up with newspapers, programs, anything pertaining to all of this, please let me know. Uh, I accept any gifts. I will consider possibly buying something if it's truly remarkable. Thank you very much. It's been a wondrous time for me. I've probably run a little bit over. It's historian's disease. We tend to dilate. Thank you very much for your attention, and we wish you a wonderful conference.